Hello students, I hope you're doing well. Please be ready to take the home notes video on the United States political system. And our objective for today is for you to understand some of the parts of the United States political system. All right, to get started, it's important for you to know that the United States has a representative democracy. And if you don't know what representative democracy is, then you need to go back to your previous notes and look up that definition. An important part of um, the American political system is the Constitution and Bill of Rights. The Constitution is literally a piece of paper and it has a set of rules describing how the United States should be governed, how it should be controlled, and um, how power should be maintained. In addition to how the country should be governed, it also includes rights for the citizens of the country. These rights are called the Bill of Rights, and these are the first 10 amendments or additions or changes to the Constitution. These rights include free speech, the right to bear arms, the right to a fair trial, and so on and so forth. Now, the right to bear arms does not mean you have the right to walk around and carry your arms around. Um, the right to bear arms in this context means that you have the right to carry a gun. If you want to um, learn a little bit more about the Bill of Rights, you can click on this video here and a new link should open up on um, at this new website called historyforkids.org on the Bill of Rights. All right, let's talk about federal verse versus unitary system of government, okay? If we think back to our def definition of government or political system, it's all about how um, control is maintained and how power is distributed. Um, you can have a federal system of government in a country or a unitary system of government. The United States has a federal system of government, and what this means is that power is divided between the national and local states, okay? You know that the United States is made up of 50 different states, and together they make up the state or the country of the United States of America. Each of these 50 states has its own limited or limited independence or sovereignty. That's what this S word is, sovereignty. Another word for sovereignty is independent. So let's say, for example, the state of Massachusetts has its own limited sovereignty um, or independence. Um, so does the state of New York. So does California and Texas. So these local smaller states remain part of one overall country, okay? And they do not have national sovereignty, and they have no power under international law. And like I said earlier, the United States has a federal system of government. Now, if you don't have a federal system of government, other countries have a unitary system. And that means that the state or the country is governed as a single unit, okay? And there is only one centralized government. So even if a country has smaller states within it, there's only one government that is maintaining control and having power over all of the states. Now, if we go back to a federal system and we're thinking about, well, power is divided between the national or between the entire country and then the smaller local states, we can think about things such as um, cell phones, the death penalty, roads, and military, okay? Um, for example, there are some states in the United States that make it illegal for you to drive and talk on the cell phone, okay? And as you know, there are lots of different states that make the death penalty illegal, but then there are other states such as Texas that makes the death penalty penalty legal. And um, for roads, it doesn't make sense for the state of North Carolina to have the power to decide if the state of California is going to build new roads. So that means that California can decide if they're going to build new roads, North Carolina can decide um, if they're going to build new roads, so on and so forth. However, when it comes to other important things such as military, these decisions and this power is done at a national or a federal level that includes all of the 50 states and covers and is powerful over all of the 50 states. 
If you want more information about federalism, then I highly suggest you watch this video. I know with the other video I said it was kind of optional, but I believe that this video here, and if you click on it, um, this will give you a really nice overview of federalism, and it's really good, especially for um, you visual learners. So I highly suggest you watch this video here. All right, let's talk about the three branches of government um, and the United States political system and in a lot of other countries' political systems. Okay, there are three branches. We have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Now, the name of office in the executive branch, uh, you probably already know, and that is the president. The president um, can be uh, in office for four to eight years. One term is four years, and then the president can be re-elected for another four years, meaning that he can be, or she, can be in office for four to eight years. And of course, the responsibilities of the president are a lot, but just one thing that I'd like for you to have down is that the president has to carry out and suggest laws. The second branch of government is the legislative branch. And the name of office for the legislative branch is Congress. Now, in America, the Congress is split into the House of Representatives and the Senate. So please make sure in your chart that you have um, written down House of Representatives and Senate. Now, for those um, people, congressmen and women who are serving in the House of Representatives, they can serve for a maximum of two years. Whereas if you're serving in the Senate, you can serve for a maximum of six years. And the responsibility of the legislative branch is to make laws. Finally, we have the judicial branch. The judicial branch is made up of the Supreme Court, all of the judges, okay? The, um, the Supreme Court judges can be on the bench for life. However, if they want to retire, they may. And they are appointed by, or excuse me, recommended by the president and then um, appointed by Congress. And the responsibility of the Supreme Court is to interpret the Constitution and review laws. For my visual learners, again, here is a graphic of um, our three branches of government. Okay, at the top we see the Constitution. Again, that's like you know, our rule book, I guess you can say. Then we have the legislative branch, which is made up of the House of Representatives and the Senate. We have the executive branch, led by the president, the vice president, and also the cabinet, his group of advisors, or her group of advisors. Then we have the judicial branch, made up of the Supreme Court and our Supreme Court justices. So again, uh, you have three branches of government, executive, legislative branch, and judicial branch. Now, important aspect of many political systems is this idea of checks and balances. And, one, and what checks and balances is, is that one branch of government can't hold total power or total control and can be overridden by another. Okay? So all three are needed to make government run properly. And again, if we go back to our political systems in different parts of a system, most definitely our executive, legislative, and judicial branch branches, excuse me, are parts of our political system. And for a political system to work effectively, you need all three. And you need to make sure that there isn't one branch or one part of that system that has too much power. So if we look at this graphic, uh, you'll see here again, we have the judicial branch, legislative branch and executive branch. And what these arrows say and do is tell you how each branch checks the power of the other branch. So for example, Congress, okay, the part of the legislative branch may impeach a judge and Senate and the Senate may reject appointments of judges. Now to impeach someone means to accuse someone in office, okay? So the Congress and the legislative branch can check the judicial branch. Likewise, the judicial branch can check the legislative, legislative branch, excuse me. So the courts may declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. So again, if we think back to what the responsibility of the legislative branch is, 
their responsibility is to make laws, but the judicial branch may say, uh uh uh, that law is unconstitutional. We don't like that law, we're not going to let it pass. Um, if we go from judicial branch to the executive branch, we see here that the uh, Supreme Court can also say that some of the actions of the president are unconstitutional. Okay, the president however, can appoint judges, okay? So the president can basically put people on the bench that he knows likes him or her, and um, it should be a pretty good relationship between these two branches. Um, the president can also veto any legislation or any um, laws that the Congress wants to put forth. Veto means to deny, to put down, to not let pass, okay? And then Congress may impeach, again, may in, um, accuse the president or may override the veto that the president sends toward the, to the legislative branch. And the Senate has to approve or reject any treaties or appointments. Okay, so the president may appoint a judge to the judicial branch, but it's the legislative branch that needs to approve it or they, they have the right um, to check the president and veto that appointment. All right, um, so what I'd like for you to think about is why do you think that in many national um, political systems there is this idea of checks and balances? What are some of the good things about this system of checks and balances and what are some of the not so good things? I hope that you have a good day and I will see you next time in class. Bye-bye.